Well, hello world, it's Terry Marshall again, coming to you as we have done many times before from the Clark Foundation Theatre in Mission, British Columbia. Um, I have to say that this particular interview is a little bit special for me because one of my two guests tonight uh, was my very first celebrity interview. And it was her kind words at the end of that interview, our conversation, that made me decide maybe I could do this a little bit more. So I'm welcoming back very happily Natalie McMaster and her husband. Now I'm going to get this right. Donnell Lee. See, I, I said to, to no, I said I was lady. I said I warned <laughs> Donna before we started that as I an English it. person I always yeah. read L E A as Lee. Yeah. So I've had a lot mm -hmm. of trouble I've been trying to practice. Now I know it's Donnell yeah. Leahy. Leahy. Okay. Right, yeah. So anyway, um, I remember from our last interview, I was mm -hmm. going back over it and we had a conversation and I asked you at the time, with all the travelling that you do did you have time for a social life? And you finally reluctantly admitted that, no, I don't have time for a social life. Well, now here you are with six children and a husband of nearly 13 years. I think your social life picked up a bit, didn't it? <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lovely story, uh, Donnell, of you tracking Natalie down and uh, finding her and asking her out on a date. I would have thought that with the, the sort of number of uh, engagements that you two play, that those first two years of dating must have been sporadic at best. What do you recall from those days? I think that's, that's, that's accurate. We, uh, we both traveled a lot, and we travel a lot now. Yes. But, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, but it, it, it was exciting. Natalie was going one way, I'm going the mm -hmm. other, and we would uh, you know, m meet and, and uh, plan. Uh, Natalie would come to our place and I go to their place and uh, but it was it was exciting always going for airplanes oh cars planes trains automobiles isn't that the, 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 that's, the title. that's the title <laughs> look at you blushing <laughs> well it, I just put blush on <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it hasn't changed that much but I mean you have famously said that you sort of dated for two years then broke up for ten and then got married but there's a little bit in missing in the middle there. I mean, did you stay in touch during that 10 years? Yeah. Wow, so how did the reunion come about if that's not too? It's the same way, with a phone yeah. call. Then I was right. in the area again, and made a call, mm -hmm. call and I was home. Mm -hmm. We hooked up, and <laughs> I think we were only dating for two months, and he proposed, and I mm. said yes before he even asked, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and look at that, look how well it worked. I would maybe come back to some some aspects of your domestic bliss later on, but I want to go a little bit into your your background, which I understand is strictly Scottish. Mm -hmm. That's right, because you talked about it. Have you had the chance to see how far back you can track that McMaster line? My uncle Buddy McMaster knew uh, mm -hmm. the connections mm -hmm. of where our actual people came from, mm -hmm. and I think. My memory serves me. I thought he spoke of the Isle of Egg. Okay, that's and possible. The, where our, our mm -hmm. descendants came from. Mm -hmm. I, I just, the reason I was asking that, I, I thought to myself that with the, that longer heritage, I wondered if the reason you ended up in Cape Breton, because when they, those appalling Gaelic clearances happened in the 19th, 18th and 19th century, a lot of Scots left that part of the world, and many of them went to your part of the world in Cape Breton. Mm -hmm. um, I believe at one time, even the speaking of Gaelic was, was banned in, in Scotland. That heritage, however, did survive in Cape Breton. Mm -hmm. Question, do you actually speak Gaelic? Hanyel. Okay. That means uh, no in Gaelic. <laughs> well, obviously, you know Becca to that. Mean a little. Yeah. But uh, no, I don't yeah. speak Gaelic. Mm -hmm. I took Gaelic in grade four, and then they stopped offering it mm -hmm. after that. So I never took it through school. Mm -hmm. And, but I know a few little words. My mm. mother grew up speaking Gaelic. Mm, yeah. the, I thought one of the interesting things about that whole episode was that I believe even, as I say, the fiddle was banned for a while, um, but that uh, the music survived. Actually, there's those of out, out there who think that they banned the wrong instrument. They should have banned the bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not going to get into that argument. Yeah. Uh, we don't know who, the Irish and the Scottish always blame each other for the invention of the bagpipes. Do you have any views on who did it? <laughs> <laughs> no. keep, keep going, fellas. <laughs> keep going. Well, what I thought was what sort of interesting about that whole um, clearance episode was that a lot of the traditional music that was banned and died out in Scotland as part of their culture was preserved in Cape Breton. Mm -hmm. 
And I think, Barney, you talked in the documentary that a lot of Scottish fiddlers now come to Cape Breton just to try and relearn some of the, uh, the tunes that were sort of lost to Scotland. Do you have any experience of that? Yeah, like there's people who try and reconnect with the roots mm -hmm. through the Cape Breton mm -hmm. style. Um, and also, I know Buddy made a few trips, and I have made a couple trips mm -hmm. over the years to Scotland. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. interested in yeah. reconnecting with the older style. And yeah, that's the historians tell us mm -hmm. that's what has happened, you know. Um, I know earlier you said strictly Scottish style for me. It, that's where it originated. So you can imagine it being transplanted to Cape Breton mm -hmm. over the last 250 years. It's evolved. I yeah. mean, there's been a, you know, there's a large French population in Cape mm -hmm. Breton and they have their own little dialect that kind of seeps into the style. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Irish, there's a little bit of an mm -hmm. Irish tradition in Cape Breton, you know, that's in there a little bit. And then the Mi'kmaq culture, you know, is, mm -hmm. there's like a little bit of an amalgamation, I think, of different styles to produce the Cape Breton sound, but it's ever evolving like most mm -hmm. styles are, mm -hmm. you know. Well, you're anticipating a question I was going to ask a, a little bit down the road. But, Donnell, you come from an Irish background, and one of the things I thought, was, I, the limited research I had time to do, I thought it was interesting that you like to farm, or continue, I say like to farm, you continue to farm. Is that part of your Irish heritage? Do they come from the land? Absolutely. Uh, mom is from my mom is from Cape Breton, so mm -hmm. I'm uh, Cape Breton and Irish. Dad's people came to uh, Canada in 1825 from County Cork, and uh, the Peter Robinson settlement uh, in Peterborough, Ontario, where near where we're from, <clears throat> we were part of that. They actually uh, tried to attract attract from Ireland farmers. <coughs> they wanted people to come and and and, and farm the land. So right back to to Ireland, our people were farmers, mm -hmm. and and. Uh, I, I love farming. Uh, we're into beef, cattle, and into uh, crops, mm -hmm. and it's it's such a great um, uh, out for me. Or uh, um, this this in this this music that we play, and the traveling, and the yeah. the go 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 to be able to go home to the farm. It's just such a wonderful trade off for me. Well, you're reading my next question, which was going to was going to say that the farming is has a lot of repetitive tasks, <clears throat> but that probably gives you a chance just to to muse. Uh, I wondered if maybe you found it a stress reliever and I think I hear you saying that's exactly oh, what it is. Oh, completely, completely, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to get on the land, to get with the animals. Uh, we have horses, you know, mm -hmm. ranch horses and just to go out and just be with nature. It's therapeutic. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, your taste in music seems to be very eclectic. Obviously, you, the sort of music you play is sort of reasonably specific, but I've read that you're interested in everything from classical to the Hot Club of France and Stefan Cropelli. Do you ever get the chance to play classical or, or jazz? I mean, is that something which you might do when you weren't performing publicly? Everything I play, I've, I've learned from by mm -hmm. ear. And uh, uh, when I was um, starting out playing the fiddle, I, I would play whatever uh, music I would hear. And then I wanted to challenge myself. And then you get into the classical stuff, uh, it's really challenging. To, and, and challenging to learn a lot of these pieces by ear. So I play classically at home, and I play it on stage as well. It's classical by ear. I, I, I didn't learn the note. And we've uh, had the good fortune of, of being able to play uh, quite a bit with the orchestras, symphony orchestras have us as, as special guests. Mm -hmm. So that's a real opportunity to, to, you know, we certainly play our music with the orchestra, but we play some, some classical stuff and, and some stuff we've written. So I think I've been, I've been um, also influenced by the classical uh, music. Um, when uh, you hear a different sound, a different instrument, a different style, you realize a whole, a whole pile more uh, options. Mm -hmm. So um, that um, certainly is uh, true with my, my music. It led to me to another thought that either you would be able to answer. Given the way that instruments evolve, I mean, look at the way the guitar has evolved over the years. Has the violin, or fiddle, whichever you like to call it, are there any major changes that would accommodate different styles of playing? Or if you play a classical violin, is it probably the same violin you play to play um, fiddle music? I think the instrument's the same. Mm -hmm. uh, classical people tend to prefer a, a softer type mm -hmm. of string and uh, maybe a, different, a slightly different setup. But any, any fiddle player, any violin player could play my instrument. 
or um, I always compare it to Saint Santa Claus and Saint Nicholas. Yeah. He's the same fellow, just two mm. different names. <laughs> yeah. That touches a bit close to me. A number of times I get hit this time of year. You make a bit. <laughs> oh, I bet. Um, I think we should move on to some of your current activities because um, obviously this is going out and ahead of your touring a little mm. bit, and hopefully people pick up on this. Um, tell me a little bit about the current album, which I haven't had a chance to hear yet, but I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I'm really thrilled with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Danelle and I, after getting married, really knew at some point in our lives we wanted to record. Mm -hmm. And the years are getting on, and we were thinking, gosh, it'd be just a shame if we left this world and no documentation of our music together. And so, you know, it took a number of years to, to come about because just life. And because you don't have anybody counting on you to do a record together, you know, there was my solo career and Danelle's career with Leahy, and so no one was expecting us to do anything. They talked about it, looked forward to it, but there was no pressure. There was no pressure, so it, you were able to put it off. So we did until we finally just said, okay, we have to make this happen. And it was very difficult trying to make it happen with the players that we wanted to record with, but it worked out in our favor because we uh, <clears throat> had postponed it a couple of times, and in that time period that we postponed it, we met Bob Ezrin. And he's a wonderful, world-class, legendary producer that is just a remarkable uh, heavyweight in the studio. And so we met him, and it just so happened that he was a fan of the music and had always wanted to do something with Celtic music. and we're we were in pre-production phase of our recording, so we decided to work together. And it made for a very great combination because Danelle and I were so um, all restructured at that point and kind of generally knew the, the f what we wanted to record and had been working on this stuff for years. So it was to a point where Bob could just wave his magic wand over, you know, and sprinkle fairy dust everywhere and make it sound like something incredible. Um, because he was able to just, it was so refined where we had it that he could take it to the next stage, you know. And there was a couple of tracks on there too that he had a lot to do with the building of. We mostly built the tracks from scratch, but there was a couple of ones that we didn't really have together and he was very, he played a big role in those, but for the most part he put the, the glistening on everything. You talked in an interview I saw a little while ago about the fact that you were just, oh, I think it was in one of the TED talks that you did, that you were getting together to do some joint composing. Is there any joint music on, on the new record? Yeah, oh. yeah, a couple of pieces we're thrilled with mm -hmm. and we'll be doing them tonight. Oh, good. Yeah. I've heard rumors that you even sing on this. Yes, I do, but you hardly can call it a singing. It's not a performance. It's a lullaby to my baby. <laughs> and, and they want me to do it, and I said, you know what? When I say they, I say Bob suggested it. He said, you got to sing on this. He was hearing me humming tunes and stuff. I said, I don't sing. He said, yes, you do. I can hear you. If I put you in the right room with the right mic and the right song, you'd be great. And Daniel's like, just try it. And I, one of the things I love about music is that I, I'll try things, you know. I don't want to limit myself because I'm afraid to do something. Like, I'll try it. I might be no good at it, then I won't bother doing it. Or if I really like it, I'll practice it a bunch so I get good at it. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what it is. So I was excited. I was, like, open to doing it, and I did it. And I didn't think it should be included on the record, <laughs> but they wanted it on, so. Well, talking about things that you do, um, since we last met, I have become much more aware than I was before just how good a step dancer you are. I mean, there's I, one of the pieces that's on YouTube is you doing the sort of drum challenge, the drum challenge dancing and so on. The thing that struck me though was coming from a Scottish background, married to an Irishman, your dancing style or the dancing style is much more alike the Irish dance than the Scottish dance. Yeah. Um, is there a reason for that? You yes, think? that's because the Scottish dancing you're probably referring to is the Highland dancing. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So there's two types of Scottish dancing, there's step dancing in Highland, so you're comparing Highland. Mm -hmm. And in Ireland, the old style of step dancing was much more like the Cape Breton style of step dancing. 
Oh, so. well, you see, I, that, I yeah. love these interviews. I learn something yeah. every time I do one. Yeah. I didn't realize that. I think it's important to note uh, Natalie specifically, um, as, as a young girl, started uh, playing down in the States quite a bit mm -hmm. and frequenting Irish festivals. And then we've met up with the bluegrass community, and they have a, a style of dance. And then where I come from in Ontario, we have a Canadian step dancing. And when, when you're a person like Natalie, who's full of music and has her eyes and ears open and wanting to meet and wanting to try and wanting to collaborate, you can't help but pick up steps, okay. tunes, nuances from these other styles. So when I watch Natalie, I see clogging, clogging in her dancing, uh, you know, flamenco, all these things. So it's become, it's become... A little amalgamation yeah. for sure. I've always been attracted to other styles of dance and yeah it comes out here and there for sure. Well you give me a perfect lead in to what I was why I asked you to bring your fiddle along was I you are presented as being one of the preeminent players in the French Canadian style. Now I'm not quite sure that as a musical ignoramus I can understand exactly what that meant. Could you tell me what typifies without sort of doing a whole concert, but typifies that style and maybe give us a little example. Well, I have thoughts about styles, and I think st a lot of styles are dictated by the bowing. Mm -hmm. You know, you put your finger down, you pull a note, or you chop a note, or you bounce a note, or you scratch a note, and a lot of that comes from, from the right hand. And, and I don't know that I'm, I'm one of the a French Canadian player. I there was a French Canadian player named Tijan Carignan mm. who influenced me greatly, and he he did things that I'd never heard before. And as a little boy playing by ear, hearing this for the first time, I just had to had to play it. What about that G reel? So you know, the there's there's a lilt. They do a lot yes. with their feet, and you know. Tijan Carignan like to do the He did this left hand yes. pic pizzicato stuff mm -hmm. that was so cool. And there's there's people now that'll put microphones oh, yes. on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. Well that that answers that question. Um and thank you for doing that. I, I was intrigued to find out if, if there was something... I, I mean, when you listen to a lot of music of all types all the time, um, you tend to get a little lost, and I was very unaware of the distinction, so now I'm much wiser and mm. happier. Um, this tour is called One, I think. The, the, the information I got said that this, you're calling this tour One. The record is called One. Okay. And, you know, people call the tour what they want. We just finished... Um, 60 shows in the U.S., mm -hmm. uh, 64 shows, uh, Visions of Cape Breton and Beyond, mm -hmm. where we took, uh, will you go ahead, Natalie? We took our family, we took oh, video yeah. screens and a band, yeah. Mm -hmm. This year, uh, tonight we're playing, we're, we're, we're at West doing a number of shows and we're, we're taking a different configuration, two fiddles, two pianos. Yeah. Oh, that's it, just two little, two pianos. Yeah. And that's why I thought it was a singular title for a show called One. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the um, prevalence of family groups, seems to be, seems to be spring up everywhere. I mean, the Willis clan and uh, your own family formed group. You're forming your own family band, aren't you, slowly? Well, what are your hopes for your, your kids? I mean, they're all so talented, at least the ones I've seen so far are all so talented. What are your hopes for them? Well, we talk about this a lot, and I mean, it sounds great to say, oh, I hope my children just, whatever they do in life, they're happy, mm -hmm. and they find what, they, what they're good at, and they, we nurture that, you know. But in the meantime, actual life is, gee whiz, I hope they play the fiddle. <laughs> 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 and I hope they're good at it. Mm -hmm. And anyway, but all jokes aside, I know that Definitely, I want them to be musical oh, yeah. from the inside out. I can't so that imagine is, what life is like without music. So I, I know. I'm 100% with you on that. Yeah. So that is genetic and it's environmental. So we obviously know that our kids have music in them, they're musical. 
Um, so we also want to give it to them just through their environment. I try and keep music playing on in the house, you know, um, and variety of music, and we make them practice, so to speak. And we also have fun sessions where we're just playing music for the fun, and they perform and all that. So it's that trying to always find that balance of encouragement, but also allowing it to come somewhat from themselves. You know, as kids, they're, they're not going to eat their vegetables until unless you make them. So at some point, you're hoping they're going to eat their mm -hmm. vegetables but on their own. So yes, we would love that, um, but we also know what it's like to be in this business. Yeah. And do we want them in this business? The way I look at it is I trust that they'll be taken care of the way we were. Yeah. And so whatever they're to become. It, anyway. down, it comes down to you give them the tools now, give them the, you know, the options yeah. if they wish to. If they yeah. want to, they, they couldn't have better parentage than that, could they? Yeah. Um, the last of my planned questions, who knows what will come out of it. Um, I hear rumors that you may be planning to do a Christmas tour next year. Mm -hmm. Well, I certainly hope that that will include a venue close to, so we can come and hear it, because this has been an absolute delight, and I hope we might have a chance to do yet a third job opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time out. I know you've got to get away because you've got a show coming up. We're looking forward to seeing it, and thank you once again. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see you again for sure. Oh, yes. Okay.